Welcome. We're so pleased to have you here at the Armory tonight. And um, I wanted to, uh, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman. I'm the program director here at the Armory. And I wanted to welcome you to our Interrogations of Form, which is a conversation series we've been hosting across the year. And we've had a wonderful range of artists and activists and academics and social trailblazers talking about a variety of topics. And I'm sure tonight will be no different. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have these wonderful artists in the building this week. So please join me in welcoming Nadia Sorota from Meet the Composer, who's our moderator tonight, uh, composer Kaya Sariajo, our artistic director and the director of this evening's piece, Pierre LD, and lighting designer Jennifer Tipton, and video and projection designer Jean-Baptiste Berrier. Please. So this is such an interesting and exciting performance and in such a unique space. Um, so I think my first question is for you, Pierre. What is different about curating at the Armory than curating at a, in a concert hall or even an opera house? Um, I think the, the main ingredient is you have a very theatrical room, which is uh, also a neutral space, but um, it offers... Um, um, something very magical for particular material. So you really need to match the material to the space. And in this particular uh, uh, project, of course, the I would say the art of Kaya Sariaho, because it's more than music, what she does, and it's a it's an experience for the audience, which goes beyond just you know uh, writing music, but Presenting that music in the right place is very important, and I think the match between the room and her, her musical world is very appropriate. So that's to go back to this particular event. But uh, yeah, that's wonderful. And Kaya, um, have you worked part of obviously part of the the unique element of the Armory is just it's a massive, massive space, the Drill Hall. Uh, so this entire concert is spatialized. Have you worked much in spatialized performances before? Yes, I, in, in many of my electronic pieces, I'm, I'm using the space. And the space is, I think it's very important in my music, more generally. Uh, but uh, this, this occasion is very special. And in what way do you use this? I know um, many of your works are very um, specific with regards to acoustic and space and resonance. And obviously this space is uh, very unique in that manner, but also the way that the performers are interacting with the audience is not exactly like this is right here. They're not, there's not a stage and the audience is right in front. So what elements, um, what was exciting about this hall and what were you excited to play with here? Well, in fact, we chose pieces where, where, which have space element already. There is my clarinet concerto, and there I've composed, it's the only piece of mine in which I have composed the movement of the, of the clarinetist in the space. So that's very appropriate here. Then um, I have another piece, uh, piece called Circle Map, that's the name of the whole project now then, in which there is electronics around the audience. And uh, this piece was already created in a um, very special space chosen by Pierre uh, in Amsterdam. And um, I think in this space, again, so the space is actively used. And then in my piece Lawn, for soprano and electronics. So the electronics are again living in the space, but Pierre also found a way for the soprano to move in the, in the space. So, and in the end of the clarinet concerto, you will see uh, also other members, some members of the orchestra are doing something unusual. So I think we are very active about space. 
Do you have, I know the uh, New York Philharmonic was here um, a few years ago in 2012 uh, doing a spatialized piece. Is, do you know though, I don't think the individual members were moving uh, apart from their, their sort of buddies. Is this the first time in your knowledge? Was it hard to get the New York Phil to, to move around the, the room? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was very easy. Only the, the solo violinist asked me how many persons you would like to move. And I said, well, everybody who wants to move, they can move. She said, well, just tell me how many, because uh, <laughs> otherwise maybe nobody moves. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, how long have you been uh, collaborating with Kaya? 35 years. Oh, 35 years. And uh, what, was the, what was the first project that you guys worked on together? Well, Kaya was um, visiting IACAM, um, the uh, research and production center in, uh, in Paris, founded by Pierre Boulez. And she was um, doing a workshop to learn to use a, a computer in music. And um, very quickly she was interested by uh, the synthesis of sound and the synthesis of uh, voice, which was very special and peculiar by that time. And she, um, f from that experience, she moved on, on uh, um, developing uh, compositional ideas in, in many domains thanks to the computer. So. Um, um, over the years, we collaborated on many different ways of, again, using um, first synthesis, then processing, but also the analysis of musical sound, and in particular, uh, the analysis of voice and of instruments to uh, construct uh, compositional materials, um, which can uh, then be explored with uh, what is called computer to composition, which are tools which allow us to prepare um, literally scales or rhythms and these kind of things. But it's, it's more later than we started to work on the image. And um, one of the reasons um, it, it took so much time is that the technology was not accessible, basically. Um, the amount of computer power which is requested to process image in real time is uh, much higher than for sound. So, um, if we can say so, uh, music technology was available earlier than image in that respect. And whenever it became actually possible, we started to investigate that aspect. And uh, in my own work, I'm particularly, in, particularly interested in the interaction between the music and uh, the image, and that is something that you can really develop um, um, through um, the fact that they are now available as computer programs which share a lot of things. So is the nature of your collaboration, it sounds like your collaboration is not that, you know, Kaya writes a bunch of notes and then you look at them and you, you make some pictures. <laughs> um, what, what, to what extent is, is the, the visual element um, a collaborative, collaboratively created? Well, yes and no. Um, one of the complexity of this project is that um, on the four pieces, three didn't have uh, a visual part. And um, I usually um, I'm very cautious about which piece I work on. And um, the reason for that is that I, I don't consider that there should be image on any music. And um, I'm actually very, um, how do you say, um, I can be very polemical about that. I think it's, extra to, to go to the point, and it's, it's, it's starting a discussion which could uh, take over, and that's not what we want to do, but uh, uh, image is invading the musical domain right now, and uh, in many ways it's taking over. And my, I, I consider my mission, so to say, uh, without uh, pretension, to try to find a way uh, that music um, is, prolongating, uh, is, is prolongated by image rather than, uh, as we see too many often, fighting with image. Many artistic collaborations are actual fights about who is going to survive uh, the show, basically, and that, that, that's really what I um, don't want to be a collaboration. I'm here uh, in this kind of project to accompany the music, not to illustrate it, but to help, hopefully, to understand it and, and feel it uh, in a different way. So that's why everything proceeds from the score and stays very near the score. So, um, all four of these pieces are actually works that have kind of extra musical 
inspiration. Um, to what extent, uh, this is both for Jean-Baptiste and Kaya, to what extent is the, the visual language um, directly uh, meant to represent these extra musical ideas and to what extent is it meant to do other things? In fact, we discussed this <clears throat> together for this project with Pierre also and, um, and then found it was convenient, it's true, that uh, the clarinet concerto was inspired by these um, old tapestries which are very beautiful and haunting and um, the, well, the circle map, in fact, is inspired more of the texts, but then it was Pierre and uh, Jean-Baptiste together who found the idea of uh, using the material that uh, we are using now. And Jennifer, um, it's a really interesting, or I guess my question is, what are the challenges involved in in lighting such incredibly diverse works with such an incredible cast of performers? Well, the challenges are great. And, uh, but just, I, I'd like to begin by adding a little bit to what Jean-Baptiste said, because I have, as well as working in theater, I have worked with the lighting concerts and lighting musicians. And my question is always, can we see and hear equally at the same time? And perhaps opera would answer that question. But uh, I, uh, I like to approach a, a musical project with, uh, with delicacy, shall we say. And in this particular evening, I have found that uh, to reflect the projections has been the, the challenge and the joy. And to, as I was saying to Kaya early, the music, I love her music. And it, uh, it's almost a meditation in finding the light. And I only wish that we had a little bit longer. <laughs> to uh, go a little bit more deeply into it. It is interesting. Um, to what extent, this is a question for any of you, to what extent is the physical action of the performers part of the visual language of this performance or not? Well, you will see in, in, a, in a clarinet concerto, it's really... Um, Gary Kriku is very amazing. Uh, he's really like an actor of, a, of, a, of the main role, and in a way that's what the concerto always is. But here, the fact of his personality and his moving into space, it's, uh, it's, uh, he, the importance is very big. And as you know, even the smallest movements of a musician, they are very important for us to perceive the music. That's why we also love the language of certain conductors and uh, are disturbed by others and, uh, and the way that the musicians breathe when they, when they play, that, that's very important. And sometimes I've uh, suffered when I've seen um, some great orchestras to play my music and then after play the second of Brahms mm. because I have a feeling that the violin section is very tense when they play my music and when they start playing Brahms for example they, they start moving and living with the music and of course I would love the, <laughs> them to have the same feeling about my music Absolutely I just Quickly, I too, I've never lit a symphony orchestra before. And what I have discovered, the light focuses the space and allows us to concentrate. And I have never been so aware that a symphony orchestra is such a living, breathing unit of a creature. It's been wonderful. It's actually interesting because to think about lighting for a symphony orchestra is actually pretty rare, right? Like they have, I feel like backstage they press setting two and the lights are really bright and everyone can read their music and it's the end. Um, so were there any challenges inherent to, to lighting the orchestra in this manner? 
Actually, the challenges were all in my mind beforehand. I was very nervous about it, and I wanted to make sure there was no light in any musician's eyes. And I definitely depended on their music stand light, but then I was saying, what about their instruments? They have to see their instruments. So all of that was happened beforehand. Once we got into the space, there were no complaints, and uh, it, it was really dreamy working with them. To think about a space like this, which doesn't have um, sort of inherent syntax, if that makes sense, when you go into a, a dance theater or a symphony orchestra, there, a symphony hall, there is a, there's a stage and everyone is pointed in the same direction. Um, were there things about this that were, I mean, to me that sounds very daunting. Were there things that were not daunting about a space that is that free to work inside? We, we tried to create, uh, in fact, a, a Greek theater hmm. with this performance because the, perform the, the seating is, is in the form that it is in Epidauros in, uh, in Greece, in the famous Greek theater, which is, of course, the start of all the performing arts. That's the, the birth of all the performing arts, including music. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a place which is both... Um, uh, um, a ritual space, but also a musical space, <clears throat> which invites the audience to focus on the center, uh, the heart of the space. And I think that's, you know, uh, the circle is, of course, the, the, the image, and the heart of the circle is where the, the density of the material, uh, uh, you know, um, lives at the heart of the volcano. Um, I think that's kind of very important in, in to understand w why we we put the audience close to the orchestra and wrapped it around the orchestra. I think that helps to <coughs> break the the barrier between the musicians and the audience, and uh, and allows the audience sitting on the floor or sitting in, in the in the in the raked auditorium to, to enjoy the relationship between the sound and the domed space. Mm. So this is, this is all, these are all elements uh, which, which play a role. And of course the, the video screen is very important, so it, 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 <clears throat> it is the, the sort of uh, heartbeat mm. of, uh, of, the, of the event. So you know, we chose to play the four pieces without interruption and hopefully without applause. That's the intention, so that, in fact, it's like a, a stream mm. of consciousness. Because I think the music is, has a very psychic uh, power to it. It's really sort of the, the music of the psyche. That's how I see Kaya's music. It's very, very primeval, but very much from inside. It's about memory and about longing and all sorts of concepts which are very, very internalized. And I think sort of it helps the audience to to make their own story, really, to to enjoy it in their own way. You know. Um, Kaya, you have another big New York event this season, uh, which is your opera La, uh, La Mort de Lain. Um, one of the pieces tonight is um, was a sort of preamble to that. Would you uh, let us know how, in what way these two pieces are related to each other? Yes, this piece loan for soprano and electronics. It's um, based on a text uh, by Chauffre Rudel, who is the uh, troubadour, um, who is the one of the three persons in my opera. And I knew already that I will uh, use his texts and his uh, vida, as they called. I don't know how you say. It biography yeah. in the 12th century, <laughs> which was often um, written, in fact, after when people had died. And um, um, t his vida is the, the starting point for my opera. And uh, this text we hear, which I'm used for alone, is a, it's a kind of study because um, I didn't want to take any medieval music for my opera, but I wanted to find my way of functioning as a composer in um, using a mode, a musical mode, but which was created my, by myself. It's not, so the music is not his music, but um, inspired by his music, and the text 
is his, and it's sung in um, ancient um, French language, Occitan. So this piece um, was was written by this troubadour, um, and the troubadour then is the inspiration for the opera? Not really. Well, what is important in the story of my opera is love and death. Well, this is very normal when we speak about opera. But uh, I, I was interested in love in that sense that what do we love when we love the other? Do we love the other? Do we love the image of that person? Do we love ourselves in that person? And um, all these feelings next to love interested me. And um, then death when we lose somebody we, we love, what are the stages, how we live that, uh, that loss? And um, that also interested me. So just recently somebody told me, oh, why did you take this romantic story and uh, uh, with Liebestod and all that? And uh, in fact, I don't find it a romantic story at all. I think it's a story of all of us. Uh, always. Love and death are the biggest mysteries in our life and uh, we all have to deal with that. And um, so that was my starting point. So um, the piece that uh, Jennifer is going to sing, is it, it's just for solo, soprano and electronics. So what were the, uh, you have a concert that goes from very small forces to very large forces. Um, what was exciting about working with those two particular constraints? Well, speaking about large for forces, exciting thing is Hesa Pekka, of course, mm -hmm. who is conducting uh, the New York Philharmonic Orchestra and who knows my music since now. I don't dare to say it, but it must be at least 40 years. Mm -hmm. so, so he really knows my music from the first pieces we studied together. So the, the knowledge he brings naturally uh, is enormous, enormous help to, to communicate my music to the orchestra and through that to the, to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, what about from sort of a visual standpoint? Are there any challenges inherent with taking something from a very, very small focus to a large focus? Yes, and uh, we decided all together at the beginning to do something which uh, would be a travel through the music, but with uh, emphasizing very different characteristics of the pieces, which are by themselves very uh, different from each other. And um, the, this um, focus and zooming effect you're mentioning is uh, reinforced, of course, uh, in the video by the capacity we have to go deep uh, and um, to basically zoom in the image or uh, zoom out when um, without um, telling too much about what people are going to see we start with something which is really abstract and we we make a travel to something which becomes more and more uh, um, concrete mm -hmm. and then inside of concreteness um, rediscover abstraction and um, so we're developing all these different uh, aspects and um, in, in a fantastic continuity with the work of Jennifer, which is um, so special. We were talking about space, but uh, something which is uh, so wonderful about what Jennifer did is the fact that, that it, it's really covering all the space and making uh, this space uh, a color palette, which is changing all the time with the music, which is really, really beautiful. And um, so we are playing all um, the possible uh, registers on, on that, and, but in, in very close connection about uh, the structure of the music and the way the music develops. But I won't tell more. Hmm. <laughs> Jennifer, you've, you've done a lot of work with dancers, and, and one of the things that Jean-Baptiste said that really just hit a weird dance note in my head um, is talking about not trying to have a visual element uh, fighting with the music, which to a certain extent is always inherent in dance. And then there's also that other thing in dance where one dancer can just completely draw your focus um, away from, from other things. Uh, obviously this is a huge challenge in lighting dance and is there any, is there any resonance here with this, with this project? 
Of course, and I do think that the light helps guide the audience eye to the place where it should be. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I'm, I just really want to see it now, so <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. And you'll, you'll hear it, because everything we've done is about hearing it. <laughs> Fair. I want to hear it now. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much, and let's, let's get to the drill hall. Thank you.